Um, I'm happy to introduce our last speaker, Dr. Thora Karatir from uh, Cambridge, where she's a welcome fellow. Thank you. Um, I always seem to have a bad relationship with the computer systems. So I'm just going to start. I don't need the slides to start. So um, we are very grateful for having received funding for a crazy idea, uh, a thought that has been in my mind for a long time, but I have never, ever received funding for and, uh, until with this call. And uh, by this, I needed to pull together a team and to find methodologies to address the, this crazy idea. And this is really where I'm going to give a presentation on what we've done for the last two years and a half. So first I will uh, try to uh, explain to you what I mean by the CNS white matter, because we are going to be looking into whether white matter dysfunction is a part of Alzheimer's disease. And that builds up to our hypothesis of that white matter dysfunction might be a third underlying or underpinning factor for the disease. And I will give you the understanding of how we tend to address this hypothesis, because the tools aren't really there. Therefore, we had to make them. And uh, just to let you know that all of this just started in January 2016. There was nothing existing prior to that date. So to start with, our human brain, as has been shown today, is actually equally divided into uh, gray matter, which is the computational part of our brain. And that's where most neuroscientists focus their attention, because that's where the neurons lie. And most of this institute, or the Allen Brain Institute, is actually focused on the gray matter. The other half of the human brain is so-called white matter. And that's where information is transmitted between the two brain areas, or between neurons. And there's been shown by computational analysis that if you, um, uh, this uh, architecture maximizes the neuronal connectivity with the minimum conduction delays and provides our brain the most comp maximum computational power. So I would argue, in order to understand how the brain functions as well, how it does not function or gets in disease, we have to understand how the white matter functions just as well as we understand how the gray matter works. So in the white matter, we mainly are occupied with oligodendrocytes that wrap their membrane around their axons in the central nervous system, producing this thick, compact myelin sheath, seen here EM. And this is a very integrative, uh, kind of intimate relationship between two cells, the oligo and the neuron, or the axon. And then uh, this increases their propagation between neurons, so the the inputs between neurons goes faster, and you can also synchronize inputs from multiple, for multiple neurons to arrive to a single point or second, secondary neuron. And this is very important for us to perceive and move and think and see and so forth for general functioning of our brain. And of course, when oligodendrocytes or myelin is damaged, it slows down the propagation of the neurons, and that can lead, or stopping altogether, can lead to both physical as well as mental disorders. And moreover, if you don't get, just generate uh, damage to the myelin or your oligodendrocytes themselves so they can't function properly but still exist, it can actually lead to neurodegeneration or swelling of the axons and microglia activation and in some cases, a cognitive decline in memory loss. What we've seen in that humans was really sparked our idea is the fact that there are these micro interacts in the white matter taken up by MRI scans. And that the, the number of these increase, of course, with aging, but the number seems to be greater in patients who have Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And that the uh, severity of these lesions really linearly almost correlate with the cognitive score. People are arguing that this may happen because the lesions are occurring at, uh, when the disease has already happened, the neurons are being damaged. But what has been shown from longitudinal analysis is that the white matter lesions are found before the onset of clinical symptoms, A, beta, plagues, and tau tangles, and that their number and severity really correlates with the cognitive impairment and the gray matter atrophy, or the neuronal death. Now, the reason why this could happen is that if you look into the vulnerability of the brain, so this is the architecture of our blood supply to the brain. And here is a human uh, section from the human brain where the vessels have been taken with up for the dye, and this is the arteries that goes into the gray matter. And you can see how the blood vessels in this picture here come from up from the bottom and also from the above into the brain. And then here where they let, here, here there are just arterioles and very small, thin 
blood vessels. That's really where the white matter is. So the white matter is extremely vulnerable to any changes that may have happened in, um, in, in blood supply to the brain, more so than the gray matter. And in fact, there was, and we look into, uh, in the, in the back into the Ro ancient Rome, there were, we have the, the saying, men sana and corpore sano, or, or uh, healthy mind and a healthy body. And there's evidence that we have that the Alzheimer's disease and as well as cardiovascular disease are somehow linked and have common risk factors. It's an interesting one. And the fact that cardiovascular health can affect the brain health, but of course, because we need the oxygen and uh, glucose has been mentioned prior in, in earlier in the symposium. What was interesting, this is why I'm really bringing this up, is that in this summer, I revealed a, a long epidemiological study that came from, it's more like almost a clinical trial in the spring 2018. It shows that if you treat people for blood pressure to reduce it to very low levels, so it's always 120 over 80, that actually re reduced the uh, re valence of cognitive incline, decline and uh, dementia. And they looked at MRI scans in these corporate, in these people, it's about five, 6,000 people. And what came out, what was really, what was significant is that there was a reduction in white metal lesions in the brain. So is it possible that you're having here with age, there is a, a vascular regulation kind of goes down or disturbed with aging, and that followed by brain function going down and, and therefore also and the neuropathology arises. And I will draw onto this that is pre uh, occurring prior to the neuropathology, but following the vascular dysregulation are the white matter microinfract. And so is it possible that the Alzheimer's disease patients are more susceptible to changes in blood flow into the brain? So this is where our hypothesis that whether these white matter lesions may be an underlying factor of Alzheimer's disease. But in order to address that, we need to have some kind of way of tools to, to mimic this. And now we are in a little bit of trouble because if you look into the mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, they haven't been really very good to, to model this. And mainly they've been using overexpression of human genes under our neuronal promoters, therefore excluding the effect of these proteins in the glial cells physiology. Moreover, so we need some kind of a model for a pathology of Alzheimer's disease that is relevant to the white matter. And, and we need to wait to model white matter infracts that is also quite difficult in, in uh, animals. And because we're going to go start modeling things, perhaps not in animals, and therefore not in vivo, but then in tissue culture, why don't we use a human tissue culture to get a little bit closer to the reality? And then we have to find a ways to understand white matter pathology to actually have some kind of a readout. So in order to do all this, you need a team of people. You can really see that it's going, going beyond anyone's one's expertise. And therefore, I, we are in the University of Cambridge, which is, I mean, most of the time is spent on the River Cam here. And you have a lovely picnics here. It's not really. But <clears throat> so we can pull together a big team of a lot of uh, people. They were all quite literally compact, almost on just one road. And uh, here is uh, the Stem Cell Institute where I sit, and here you have Lisa Hall, who's an engineer in the same building. You have Stephen Lee, who's a microscopist and chemist, just up the road. And then you have the medics, a uh, little bit down, over, down more, a little bit further away, about 10 minutes. And then uh, we have biochemist and an uh, epidemiologist. And then in order to have this possibility across all these big, big labs, we generated so-called a cloud. So all the postdocs and students were all put together in one place, and they kind of hovered over and interacted with all the PIs in the existing labs, and they could go in and out as pleased. So now we want to, do, to pull this together and start first to model the human gray and white matter. So to do that, we collaborated with also people in Karolinska Institute, where we could get um, lots of IP, uh, fibroblasts from patients, and uh, we got uh, patients line with the, the APP mutation, the Priscillian mutations. But what's interesting is that we could get uh, control and patient line that were matched to all the genotypes because they've all been sequenced. But also interesting is the fact that uh, these are family members. So you could have a, you know, a brother and a sister, mother and a daughter, and so forth. And then we also have, uh, we've now baked 15 lines 
from, uh, from the Karolinska Institute and uh, generated neuronal progenitor cells from these. And we also have the, uh, the clinical records and we know the patients all have white matter lesions. Now just to remind you about to trying to make the white and gray matter, so we have here in the gray matter, we would have, for example, a cortical neuron that then extends their axons through the white matter. The axon is going to be covered by myelin. That's oligodendrocytes. About 99% of an axon is covered by myelin for cortical neuron. But then you also have other cell types. So you have astrocytes and microglia as well, both in the gray and white matter. So you need to generate these cell types if you're going to generate a model. So using this uh, IPS technology, what we started with is to do neuroepithelial stem cells. And from that, we could drive into neurons and oligodendrocytes and astrocytes, but then to drive microglial cells that come from another origins. We used a few different uh, ways, but we settled with trying to get from the yolk sac, which is where microglia are thought to originate from early in embryonic time, and we collaborated with uh, Florence Genox in uh, Singapore in order to generate these cells. And here you can see the microglia alongside with neurons. So the neurons are fine. So if you just record from them without inducing any, anything, just in a, you see that in the voltage clump or current clump, they get there's a synaptic inputs are generated, so network is generated in the culture dish, and they fire extra potential by themselves. But in order to do microglia, you really want to drive them to have the microglia phenoprinting. You really have to culture them with neurons. And I'm not going to show you all the RNA seq. I'm going to show you something instead that I thought was so funny. Uh, that's here, my, my postdoc decided to have a look when we were trying to drive the microglial cells. The microglial cells are here in red. The cortical neurons are seen just with the, uh, fluores uh, the bright field. And I want to kind of focus on this, what's happening here. And you can see that the microglial cells get really busy and they start to uh, fiddle around with this nuclear kind of cluster, pulling it. But also if you look at some certain persons, <laughs> microglia cells here, they are pulling and cutting between axons that are growing between neurons. And they're really busy kind of mendling and dictating the neurons who can be connected to whom and where they're supposed to be. It's a bit fun funny and a surprising observation. So we thought, what well, if they're doing this, does it have any, can we find any differences in the neuronal physiology by having microglia there? And what we found is that if we record from the neurons with no microglia added but, uh, or with a microglia added, we see that the proportion of neurons that have inputs, that receive input at early time points, are much higher. So the, with microglia, it seems to be that there are more synaptic connex, connection made when the microglia are added. And the frequency of inputs is also higher. So there's more synapses per neuron. So there's more neurons with synapses, and each neuron has more synapses per synapse. They, they, it really kind of clusters into two different uh, categories. And I've rarely seen in my life as a biologist two separate categories like this. And this all cannot be just explained by that we've accidentally had some astrocytes present in the cultures because we don't feel, um, find many astrocytes there. This GFP is marked here, but we don't see any positive staining. So now, in order to pull all together into actually making the gray and white matter, we used microfluidic devices where we can have neuronal cell bodies here. This would be where the gray matter is. And there's another gray matter where other neuronal cell bodies are here. And they then stand their axons across, and this is where the axonal tract size or the white matter. And then you can add in the glial cells in the right proportions as they would be in gray and white matter. And here you see um, oligodendrocytes, different shading here, a bit higher magnification of myelinating oligodendrocytes. So now we have the model of gray and, gray and white matter in a dish. Can we have model the white matter microinfract? So therefore, it's taking away oxygen in one compartment only to have a focal de deletion. In order to do this, we have to somehow deplete. So the whole culture is, of course, an incubator, and you only want some small part of it to be affected by uh, oxygen depletion. And to do that, we decided to make an electrode that can uh, scavenge oxygen in one part and therefore deplete oxygen uh, only in where the axons are, but leaving the cell, the, uh, cell bodies of the neurons intact and see what effect that had. 
But in order to do so, we had to figure out a way to identify which neurons would have then have experienced oxygen depletion. So we generated a, a reporter, a GFP reporter that has a, a tag on it that uh, regulates its degradation in the same way as hifon alpha, and is also the expression of GFP is regulated by hifon alpha promoter. So it's degraded at the same time as hifon alpha would be, and it's, you can block this. So oxygen depletion will block the degradation uh, of hifon alpha as well as the GFP. So here's a negative control, and what if we have the electrode in a 5% inc incubator with 5% oxygen, you can see an increase in the GFP now happily, uh, helpfully colored green, they're red. And then if you block the degradation, the blocking this degradation here, then uh, you would uh, still have quite a high amount of the GFP in similar ways with hifon alpha. And we see that we get a saturation in the system by three hours of the electrode. And uh, if we now to have it really focal in one cover slip, we can make a uh, resize the electrode. And uh, here we have a, one cover slip and only half of the cover slip will be covered by the electrode. And you can see here is that the, HIF, the intensity for HIF on alpha goes up just underneath the electrode, but not on the other half of the cover slip. So we're having a focal uh, depletion of oxygen on a cover slip. So now is to try to get the advanced technology set up. And in order to that, we wanted to identify both A beta and tau and to find out in what kind of species they were, where they were oligomers. And we've uh, developed the technology called, we coined AD paint. And here we can see, we can detect oligomers as well as we can identify uh, fibrils. And we can identify also the concentration of A beta and we can generate and put on the cell cultures to see how they spread or if they're taken up. So if we put A beta in the cell bodies, they transport it down the axons and we can detect them inside the axons. But what if we add A beta on the axon? So if oligodendrocytes would release A beta around from the myelin, we can see that A beta is taken up by axons if it's put around them and is actually transported back to both areas of the culture. So it may be that in the axons it can port back to the cell body both pre and postsynaptically. So in kind of conclusion, we have the white matter lesions seem to occur before clinical signs and correlate with cognitive impairment in disease and that reducing oxygen blood pressure can reduce uh, white matter lesions, indicating that in fact white matter lesions are due to lack of oxygen supply. So the tools we've generated now is that we've man managed to generate all the types of glial cells and neurons that we needed to, to mimic human white and gray matter. We have uh, generated this by, by microfluidic devices that allow for live imaging at high resolution. And we've mounted an electrode that we can do a focal lesion within in vitro in a cover slip, and that we can detect now A beta species and image spread between different cellular compartments. So I want to thank the uh, Font you know, Alan Fontier's group to really believe that this might be possible and uh, help us to make these tools, because now we can, for the first time, really investigate whether this has any role in uh, potential in the context of AD. And uh, I want to thank all the collaborators. So these are, this is the team, this is the people hired on the ground, and these were the external collaborators. Thank you. We have time for one question. Jeffrey? Uh, Thora, I, I, I'm very much out of this field, but I have a confusion. Um, I thought that people in the AD field tried to increasingly separate vascular dementia or multi-infarct dementia or that kind of thing from these other types that might be many kinds of AD. It seems like you're talking a lot about things that could be that vascular multi-infarct stuff. And together with that, might there be at least two kinds of things that go wrong in white matter? And one is, in your model, you show these incredibly long axons. You know I think about axons. Those are part of the neuron. So could there be white matter lesions that are neuronocentric and some that are oligo or microgliocentric? And since they talk to each other, what do you think about all that? Well, this is what we want to model. So first of all, I don't think necessarily there are, we can so easily segregate vascular dementia from AD 
particularly a lot of the uh, samples we look at, we look at the gray matter. So when we um, do the uh, post-mortem, post-mortem is mainly done in the gray matter. And even many tissue banks, they don't even collect white matter. So part of our grant was to collect white matter from a consortium of aging and look into what is happening in white matter and whether it correlates to Alzheimer's disease or not. So with A, beta and tau pathologies are known because we have the gray matter segment. So there are things coming out from that aspect of the grant and I didn't have enough time to go into that as well that indicate there's more happening in the white matter that might have previously been, um, that has been overseen because it hasn't been looked into. So whether or not the white matter lesions are all primary white matter or they are secondary, it's a good question. And I think now with our microfluidic device, we can start to kind of have some, you know, still in, you know, still vitro. We can have some way to distinct, to dis detangle these questions, to have perturbation in the white matter, to look at, in the white matter, <laughs> to look at what happens with the cell bodies. And we can also have perturbation in the neurons to see how effect that has on the glial cells in the, you know, the white matter compartment, right, to, to you know, to address that. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks.